Welcome from CVI 2017. I'm Dr. Michael Luna here with Dr. Leon Varjabedian from the Carillion Clinic uh, in Virginia. He'll be talking about transcable impella for high risk PCI and subsequent persistent aortal cable fistula. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Luna, and thank you for the opportunity to present. This is an interesting case, uh, just pushing the envelope uh, using your structural tools doing coronary cases. So the, the case is transcable impella for high risk PCI with subsequent uh, AV fistula. This is a sick 66-year-old female with history of end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis who presented to the, to the hospital with VFib arrest during dialysis. Patient had CPR and return of spontaneous circulation and shock therapy. She had another VFib arrest actually in the emergency department. However, she regained her pulse back and she was admitted to the CCU service. Cardiology, cardiology for, was consulted and the initial cardiology consultation recommended medical therapy until stabilization and left heart catheterization when patient is more amenable for that. Past medical history includes coronary disease with two CTOs, including CTO of the CERC and CTO of the RCA. The RCA was stented before with mildly reduced ejection fraction, peripheral arterial disease with right common iliac stents in the past, and surgical disease, AFib, hypothyroidism, survival of breast cancer. Patient is a former smoker with social history, infrequent uh, alcohol use, and no drug use. Hospital course was bumpy. Patient had prolonged hospital admission. She went into AV block that uh, required pacemaker placement. A repeat uh, echo at that point showed her ejection fraction actually declined to moderate to reduce EF with 30-35%. However, patient uh, uh, family persisted aggressive medical therapy and based on the findings, uh, we proceeded with the heart catheterization. The initial plan was to do conservative management. However, the family insisted on invasive medical therapy. Patient had the left heart catheterization to, de to de delineate the, the reason for the VFib arrest, and she was found to have uh, a CTO of the RCA, a CTO of the CERC that we know from before. She had kind of a large dual LAD system, a big septal branch with a calcified lesion at the origin with the lesion in the LAD in the mid-segment. You don't see it well here, but the ostium of the left main also had a significant lesion. Therefore, patient has significant uh, disease in a single vessel with low ejection fraction, and with a very complicated hospital course. Now, remember, the patient had peripheral arterial disease, uh, especially the right iliac artery. Therefore, the plan was to do uh, uh, support, uh, uh, mechanical support PCI. Now, this patient, because she had endostriogenal disease, we want to preserve her uh, subclavian arteries and her uh, uh, brachial arteries for future need for AV fistulas. And with the presence of peripheral arterial disease, we elected to, do, to go transcaval. As you see, the, we uh, uh, do the transcaval procedure. We go in the, in the vein and the artery, and then we uh, align the snares with the guide catheter in the vein. We cross with a stiff wire, a stato in this case, and then uh, after the sheath goes. And in this case, we had difficulty actually even going to the aortic wall with the sheath. Therefore, we had to balloon dilate the aortic wall with a small 2-0 balloon, and then eventually uh, um, uh, cross with the stiff wire, and then and uh, upsize to a 16 or, or 14 French sheet, depending on the uh, 14 French sheet uh, based on the uh, impella support. Uh, and this is showing exactly how the impella goes in into the valve. And then we proceed with rotation arthrectomy due to the presence of calcified lesion at the bifurcation of the LAD, of the dual LAD, LAD system. Patient, patient is rock solid hemodynamics. We do uh, bifurcation stents at the mid LAD, and then we complete the procedure with another stent at the ostium of the left main. This is how the ostium of the left main looks and the bifurcation stands at the end of the procedure. Interestingly, we, we finished the procedure as, as uh, advised with putting an ADO2 plug. However, we noticed persistence of uh, an AV fistula there and the consistent, shunt, persistent shunting. Usually those cases that uh, we wait and then those re uh, uh, resolved by themselves, and you, you see the CAT scan after the procedure, there's persistent fistula going, and there's persistent flow going from the aorta to the vein, despite having the plug in there. Now, the problem with this patient, as you remember, patient had low ejection fraction. Patient actually, after the procedure, went into coronary shock, and she was dependent on, on pressors, and therefore, in our mind, we had a question whether the closing, whether the plug did anything, uh, or at least we could have reduced the shunt 
counting that's going on, that would have helped at all. And this is again the CAT scan showing uh, there's an, a pseudo aneurysm there at the aortic side on the right side and how the plug is actually tilted. Now, uh, I mean, in this case, we, we, we thought, let's take the patient back to a cath lab and see how the shunting is doing, if there's anything else needs to be done for the shunt to reduce the cardiac shock from the high uh, AV fistula that we have. And that's what we did. We actually went back and we accessed the single groin that we have, which was on the left side. We, we put a, 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 a graft stents, a VBX, 10 times 39 at the site of the plug, we post dilated that with an atlas balloon and you see next the, the shunting actually disappeared. Interestingly, patient also recovered hemodynamically, she was off pressors, she'd actually got discharge. So this case actually points out a few more important things. That transcable uh, impella placement actually is a valid option in patients who has actually minimal uh, alternative peripheral access, including they don't have any subclavian or peripheral access, like in this case if they have stents, if you want to avoid going through stents. And then consider putting an aortic covered stent if you have a persistent shunt go causing hemodynamic compromise in these patients. Patient uh, luckily went home on dual antiparietal therapy after 40 days of hospital stay. Wow, that's a great case. Uh, admittedly, I have no experience with transcable uh, therapies in, in any respect at this point. Um, and so, um, uh, the question, one of the questions I had uh, um, in terms of, of sealing the, the fistula that, that is created between the two great vessels, um, that looks like an AD, a regular ADO. ADO2. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm, we must be missing the other, the disc uh, on, the, on the IVC side, because the AV, ADO2, as you know, has two discs and then a mid-body, mid but that, that tend to look like just a single disc on the aortic side. So do you all normally use? A single disc. Uh, no, I use a single disc. So this is the regular ADO. This is ADO. Yeah, this is regular ADO. And the ADO2 has actually uh, two discs and then with a middle filling body, uh, which is a newer, newer, newer device. So this is the, the regular this ADO. Sizing was, I believe, was ten for the disc and yes. eight for the mushroom. Yeah. So those are the those are the, the normal measurements for that. Do you normally use this type of device, or have you all considered using other uh, uh, types of devices? I mean, throughout my training, we persistently use th these devices for the trans cable. Uh, we don't have extensive experience trans cable, but the uh, few cases that we did, we used this as a, as a primary sealing uh, device for the uh, aortic. Whole. Right, right. And, and uh, do you ever consider at any point uh, primarily using covered stent to, uh, without a that's, device? That's a good question. Before this case, we never thought of using any covered stents, but that's a very valid point. Mm -hmm. After this case, I think it's a very valid point, especially if you have persistent shunting. But interestingly, most of the shunting, even in the, in the, in the major uh, study that they had 100 patients, all they say that uh, uh, with the reversal of anticoagulation, these patients do very well. And even if they come, image them after 30 days, even if there's a slight, uh, you know, blood going from the aorta to the vein, there's no hemodynamic compromise. Mm -hmm. But it's a special case because patient actually did not come off pressors after the procedure, right. which was an indication to think out of the box and going with the covered stents. Right. Ideally, we do not use covered stents. We just, with the plug, if it works, and even the persistent shunt, they do okay. Right, right, right. What are the vascular considerations when using a covered stent in that area of the aorta? Um, in terms of covering other important, uh, this is a short ranges. correct. This is a short covered stent. Uh, you have to make sure that you're not covering the origin of the renal vein or the renal art or the renal artery, and you're way above the bifurcation. This is basically a very short one, uh, it's almost a 20 or 30, this was a 40 millimeter, 39 millimeter in length, and we were comfortable that we're not covering any side branches. And do you all normally uh, do selective angiograms of the mesenteric vessels before deploying? We did not. We did just do a general. Uh, a pigtail injection with a 20 cc of contrast just to delineate the anatomy. We did not specifically go and engage all the side branches to make sure that we were above. We were comfortable with the pigtail injection that we were above any side branch occlusion. Great. All right. Thank you so much. Great case. Thank you, sir.